Hello everyone. Welcome to day 4 of Tech Insight webinar series organized by IEEE DBC student branch in association with IEEE Bombay section. Microelectronics are the unsung heroes of our everyday lives. Well, to provide us with the insights on microelectronics in India, R&D, training and career opportunities, we have amongst us Dr. B. Satyanarayana, sir. Now I request Ms. Crystal Fernandez, IEEE Student Branch Joint Secretary, to kindly introduce the speaker for today's webinar. Thank you, sir. Hello, everyone. This is Crystal Fernandez, the Joint Secretary of IEEE DBCA. I would like to introduce you all to the speaker for today, Dr. Satya Narayana. Dr. Satya Narayana did his BTEC in Electronics and Communication Engineering from JNT University, Hyderabad, and PhD in Physics from IIT Bombay. He is working in the Department of High Energy Physics, DIFR, since 1983, and is currently a scientific officer. He is also a visiting professor at the Applied Science Department of American College, Madurai. His areas of interest include detectors and instrumentation for high energy and nuclear physics experiments. He worked on many major experiments, including a series of underground experiments at Kolar Gold Fields, D0 experiment at Fermi Labs. Currently, he is fully engaged in building a mega science experiment called ICAL at the proposed India-based Neutrino Observatory. Dr. Satya Narayana is a fellow member of Institution of Electronics and Communication Engineers as well as the Institute of Engineers. He is a member of the Governing Council of Instrument Society of India as well as a member of Indian Physics Association. He is a senior member of IEEE. He is a member of the Executive Committee, Secretary and Chair of Signal Processing Society of the IEEE Bombay Section. He won the IEEE Bombay Section's Outstanding Volunteer Award for 2014 and the IEEE Headquarters MGA Achievement Award for 2016. Dr. Satya Narayana has published over 240 research papers and proceedings in national and international journals and conferences, besides scores of in invited talks. His very first paper won the Best Paper Award by Institution of Electronics and Telecommunication Engineers. He guided and co-guided a large number of undergraduate, master and doctoral students. He served on many doctoral and expert committees, as well as college, universities, academic councils, boards of studies and advisory boards. He is on editorial and referring teams for several prestigious science and engineering journals. I now request sir to kindly take over the session. Sir, we request you to kindly take over the session. Okay. Okay. So, so can you hear me, uh, uh, sister? Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Can you hear, yes, me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 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 so, thank you for this opportunity to kind of interact with you on this day. Uh, today, I'm going to talk uh, on the microelectronics electronic scenario in the country uh, in terms of the R&D training and uh, also the career opportunities for uh, many of the students like you. Uh, I have lots of stuff. I hope I'll be able to cover it. But uh, in case, uh, you know, if I go a little fast, you feel free to kind of ask questions on the chat window and so on. And I think our organizers will be able to bring that to me. Uh, when we talk about microelectronics, of course, we are talking about study and manufacturing of very, very tiny, small electronic circuits or components, which are usually made from semiconductor materials, right? And many components of this, even normal electronic components that we see in the market are also available in the, this particular microelectronic equivalent. Now, uh, when we do, when we uh, buy normal components and want to connect them, of course, we use regular wires or, you know, clutch boards or whatever. But here, in order to connect up such tiny components, sometimes there are special techniques like wire bonding and so on and so forth. Now, as these microelectronics technologies improve, of course, the scale of microelectron components continue to reduce, decrease. We'll see about this a little later. And at completely small scale, 
the the relative impact of these intrinsic circuit properties like you know what we call stray capacitances and so on and the interconnections between what we talked about these wire bonding and things like that they become very significant so goal of uh, the microelectronics engineers in fact the challenge of the engineers uh, is actually to find ways to compensate and minimize this effect because if there is a at a high speed if there is a stray capacitance it is actually going to reduce uh, you know help uh, reduce the uh, it will result in reducing the operating frequencies and uh, but at the same time you also want to deliver very small very fast very low power very cheap these are all quite important facets of microelectronics and some sometimes you will find that it is quite hard really to deliver these things okay but that is the challenge of microelectronics engineer and uh, for the design of course many of you use the so called eda software which of course stands for electronic design automation tools without which it's not possible to design such a tiny circuits and so on that doesn't really mean that the so called macroelectronics has disappeared from the scene uh, but actually there are also the remarkable progress that is also made on enlarging the system scale not going micro but actually macro where the devices are distributed but still together you know they are integrated over a large substrates okay? and uh, the sizes are much 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 bigger than of course semiconductor uh, wafer what are the examples examples are for example flat panel displays which of course you have seen they are rapidly replacing the so called crts cathode ray tubes which we many of us used to use earlier as monitors for choice for computers and now you have huge tv screens computer screens and the flat panel displays have actually enabled applications which were not at all possible earlier by crt okay and uh, for example there are rollable displays which are uh, you know possible to print on very thin film solar cells and so the solar cells are actually fabricated like by printing as if you print on a printer on a, on a piece of paper on an electronic skin and demonstrate complete further you know desirable attributes for macroelectronic system uh, it's not only going like a large areas but also adding flexibility and portability and of course cost because i'm producing at a at a, a technology which is much different than what you use for microelectronics now this particular growing trend of fabricating microelectronic products directly on flexible substrates you know which are like polymers sometimes we call right polymers are something like plastic films these displays of very very large areas uh, will be very light because you are you are printing them on a on a very thin film and you can actually roll them up you can wrap around let us say on a display around a building okay and uh, they can also be a flexible polymer substrate can lend themselves to very very low cost fabrication as i said uh, the uh, just give me a second Hello. And talk loud, just And uh, so they are uh, resulting in very, very lightweight, rugged, and very flexible system. So I'm not going to talk about macroelectronics anymore. But I really wanted to tell you while we talk for the rest of the talk today on microelectronics. Uh, we all must remember that the macroelectronics is also making rapid uh, strides in terms of getting many many applications. We did talk today here more of displays, but there are also other uh, devices that have become very very popular. So uh, as I said, I'm not going to talk anything more on macroelectronics, but I just wanted to give a context in which we are speaking. Uh, when we talk about microelectronics, of course, what comes to our uh, head mostly is digital electronics. Uh, as against so called the analog electronics uh, digital electronics are making rapid strides for last 10 20 years in fact they continue to grow very very rapidly and now most of the time you will find that it is the digital electronics which is actually dominating almost all the applications today we see whether it is computers whether it is communications or you know sometimes digital audio consumer goods and so on why is that it's it's because uh, we find it is very easy to kind of operate in the so called binary and digital logic rather than a continuous uh, uh, you know um, uh, waveforms and handling all the frequency components in a continuously varying signal and uh, since because we are only talking about either a zero or one we actually have a excellent noise humidity 
Uh, so what happens between zero and one, the band that you have, you will see in the next slide, is something which is helping like a cushion for us in case our systems are made uh, not really with uh, you know zero noise, but uh, it can really make it will it will really help you uh, by way of uh, providing you noise immunity. And as we mentioned here, of course, the, the digital electronics are uh, you know continuously increasing in their speed. You have Ethernet's of several tens of gigabytes, data links, and uh, computers, of course, nowadays run on several gigahertz and so on. What is also important, I think, is uh, because even though if you say that uh, you know, if you have to completely forget about analog, there might be applications which you have to forego. But the good part is many of these applications now even becoming, uh, you know, uh, easier to even implement by digital summation and so on. You would have seen, we will also see later in the talk that how you can actually mimic uh, signal processing in the analog electronics by using purely digital circuits. So therefore, uh, when, you are able to kind of achieve lots of good things about digital electronics at the same time, keeping in mind and keeping in use of the old analog electronics. So that is what is really doing a win-win situation where uh, there is no need to hang on to analog electronics, but at the same time, the digital advantages of digital electronics is also playing a big role. And most important for all of us, obviously, is that lots of basic logic to complete IC assemblies and you know, of a big range of complex functions uh, that are available. You Google for whatever function you want in a digital circuit, one or the other company is actually making it. So availability uh, compared to analog electronics is what is also important why people, especially the younger generation, of course, prefer more and more digital electronics. Uh, when you talk about digital electronics, of course, uh, the only element that is the basic element for all these digital electronics is a very humble transistors. You know that transistor using as a switch uh, where you pull the collector to a VCC and you know you drive the base with whatever signal that you want. And depending on whether the uh, whether the switch is on, whether the you know base to emitter is in this case NPN, whether it is forward biased. Uh, so therefore, whether the base to emitter is conducting or not, is what is actually giving a, a transistor to be, uh, let us say, off or on. And based on that, how you uh, connect up the collector is something which is going to define to you uh, when you say VCE. VCE is the collector voltage here. Uh, in the case of on stage, of course, you have that voltage equal to just a very small VCE. And if the transistor is off, of course, the entire VCC is going to become up, appearing at VCE. So you, do, you now de, uh, define, uh, you call one as zero and other words one or vice versa. But the moral of the story is that uh, at the core of the digital electronics is the transistor. That is what the basic element. Please remember this uh, at the very end, uh, we are also going to talk about possibly another basic element trying to replace the transistor. And uh, so that will be an interesting end to this lecture, right? Uh, now, uh, since we talked about the noise immunity and so on and so forth, it doesn't matter whether you, you know, of course, you want to define what is zero and what is one or zero and high, and whether you use which or family of digital electronics, whether it is TTL or CMOS, uh, you know that, you know, you define the so-called VL and VH, which is the smallest voltage for the high signal, and the VL is the, uh, the biggest signal, biggest voltage for the, for the low signal. And what I was actually trying to tell you right now is the margin that you have, the gap that you have between the so-called high state and the low state, I have actually tried to give you a little elaborate on it. So if I am taking inputs from somebody, I'm actually defining the low voltage, low state rather, and high state rather in this particular voltages. And but which allows me to provide this kind of noise margins for the low state and the high state. And you can see when I'm providing on the output, I'm able to provide even a better uh, range of uh, low and high uh, by providing you this noise immunity, which means even if you, even my circuit is not so well defined, my board level noises are, you know, higher than what I expect, uh, I can still provide, ensure that there is a reliable switching from low to high and high to low, and uh, ensure that they're not happening because of the spurious noises that are riding on my printer circuit board. So that is the biggest uh, advantage why we all like to work with, you know, uh, let us say digital electronics, okay? Uh, 
here I'm making a claim here. I'm saying that no matter what digital circuit that you want to build today, they are essentially divided into three generic components. One is you want to connect from one point A to point B, let us say, by wire, by wire bond, by PCB, inside circuit, ASIC, doesn't matter whatever. So I'm talking about just a line, and then I'm talking about so-called combinatorial circuits, or you can say gates and so on, for which I actually provide certain inputs here, and I expect certain output here, and I represent this whole thing by a logic equation, Boolean equation, and so on. I have the third kind of device, which where I actually provide certain input, and the this device is going to store that input, going to store that input, even if I remove the uh, input here, and then I can decide that state, whether I want to bring it uh, on the output, and when should I bring it. Similarly, if I want to latch or if I want to register it, I can decide at what time I should be able to push this input to into the device. So this is normally called clock. At that clock sign, nine, the input goes here. And this is usually called output enable, where I, I kind of allow the, the stored data to come out, you know, like memory devices, for example, they're registers, right? So please remember this. So sometimes you have to keep asking throughout my lecture, is it true that all the electronics, digital electronics is only really made of these three elements? Okay, if you find that is not the case, please ask me a question maybe at the end of the lecture. You're saying that, no, no, it doesn't look like true that uh, all the digital electronics is only made of these three elements, right? Sometimes this is called combinatorial circuits. Sometimes these are called sequential circuits, okay? That you must have kind of heard about. Now, uh, when you talk about digital electronics, of course, there are varieties of digital electronics from the way they are manufactured and supplied. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, the most common ones, I'm sure you identify what these are very well. You must have used in your college. They are, of course, manufactured by many IC industries, Motorola, uh, Texas Instruments, and sold in, you know, cages, right? I mean, they are very cheap because they're a large number. They're produced in a very large number, and they're produced by multi multiple manufacturers. Uh, so sometimes they're called industry standard integrated circuits. You can call them as ICICs, which means they're freely available. They're easy. You can go to a small electronic shop and say, please give me 7400, the person will be able to give because these are very cheap and they're easily available. The other variety of uh, circuits or integrated circuits that are manufactured are what is called application-specific integrated circuits. So as the name says, uh, these chips are actually designed for a very, very specific use, maybe for you or for me or for an industry. It's not uh, like a general purpose devices like the way you saw 7.4 series or op amps or whatever. Okay, so obviously uh, you design such circuits only if uh, you will not be able to, if you are not able to get uh, the required ICs or required function block in the market, because there is no point in making this if they are freely available, right? So you will only make a customized chips only if they are not available in the market for the function that you want. Uh, we'll also see a little bit later uh, what are the difficulties in fabricating an ASIC and so on and so forth. So something between these two, you actually have what is called application-specific standard products. Okay, application-specific uh, standard products. Sometimes they're called ASSB, uh, which means that these are the ICs which are between the industry standard and, and let us say, an ASIC. So which means this is... Of course, it implements a specific function. So, which means that I, I, this is something like an ASIC, but it's also true that it's not that made only by one or two people, but they are made by many, many, many companies. May not be as many as you know, industry specific integrated ICs. For example, these are like class of chips. Suppose somebody is making controller chips for a PC. Let us say somebody is making a microprocessor, somebody making chips for modem, somebody is making chips for video or audio or encoders or decoders. Now, these are not exactly ASICs because uh, all the people who build PCs will use the chip. So it is not very, very specific, but at the same time, it is not like, you know, uh, it is very general purpose. So if you are making a modem device, if you are making, fabricating a, a hub, uh, an internet hub and so on, you might want to use a chip made by Qualcomm. Similarly, another company may be making, but these are not, 
uh, you know, these are specific to a particular application, just like an ASIC, but they are sold, these kind of ICs are sold by many different vendors, which is typical of standard part. So you can very well imagine, there is one end of ASIC, there is other end of industrial grade uh, computer chips, there is something in between uh, these two, right? So that is something very important to understand. Now, if you go back to uh, really understand the history of integrated circuits, of course, you have to go back to uh, many, many years, maybe 60 years back. Um, there, as we already mentioned, of course, ICs are mostly made of large number of transistors, which are fabricated in a single chip. Uh, now, depending on at what uh, year you're born, probably uh, there, are, there are different class of ICs. Uh, when I was born, probably uh, we had about 100 transistors in a chip. And uh, most of you, when you are born, probably there are 1 billion transistors uh, in a chip. So it depends on that, you know, small scale integration, medium scale, large scale, very large scale, ultra large scale, and so on and so forth. This is how the integrated chips have kind of uh, progressed over a period of time. And what is the main important point is that we are very, you know, we always have a hunger for packing more and more uh, you know, transistors into smaller and smaller uh, area, right? Now, so therefore, when you talk about BLSI electronics, the main objective that is coming up is, A, I want to increase the circuit speed, the speed of the IC should be very high. I want to reduce the power that is consumed to be as low as possible. I also want to make chip maybe in few millimeters square and so on. Now, you will soon very quickly realize that you know, increasing speed, reducing power, reducing area, et cetera, these are like, you know, in a way, uh, what you call uh, contradicting to each other, and there is a challenge in doing all this. So obviously there should be some trade-off uh, between them, but that is exactly the challenge of many of you who really want to take up, let us say, careers in microelectronics and BLSI, okay? That is why we are going to kind of end up uh, talking towards the end about this. So as I mentioned earlier, when you use these uh, simple 7-4 series, and maybe you did an experiment in the first or second year of your uh, college, you would have found out, okay, took a breadboard and you know pushed these chips there and took some wires which are available in the lab and connected and made the circuit that you wanted. You wanted to implement some simple LED driver or you know some truth tables you wanted to implement, whatever. So you took these black uh, you know, colored uh, wires and connected input of this to going to coming from an output of another and so on and so forth. And uh, you ensured that everything is proper and so on. Of course, this is perfectly fine. And when you switch on the circuit, it works fine. There's no issue about it. What is the problem? See, the problem is that if you make um, you know, such kind of thing, it is going to be very con time consuming because you have to obviously connect uh, wire by wire. And it's also very risky if you want to develop you know, if you want to develop some simple circuits like this, obviously I don't find problem, but if you are to develop very, very big circuits, obviously are going to kind of have a problem. And uh, if I want to make some correction or I want to make development, it becomes quite, quite, quite tough. Imagine you, uh, you use such kind of circuitry uh, to build a cell phone, for example, you'll realize how tough it is and how big the cell phone would be when you make them. So therefore programmable logic you know, if I can program the logic that I have both by, by interconnecting these wires as well as what is inside individual IC, that will solve the problem. Not only that, it will also give many other benefits. And what is the main benefit? My main benefit is when I buy this chip, which is so-called, let us say, NAND gate. NAND gate is a NAND gate by birth. I can't change the function of this, right? Even if I am very clever and I wanted to do something very interesting, but if I, if I buy 7474, 7400, of course it is only NAND gate. I can't change the function. But if somebody gives me a programmable logic device, maybe I can program it, program it, I can implement some very interesting architecture in, my chip, in the chip in my lab or my office or my industry, and I'll be able to probably enhance the functionality of performance system. This is the basic philosophy between the, behind programmable logic devices. And uh, in the beginning, when this when the programmable uh, logic devices came in, it came with a very rudimentary way. What, what do you mean by that? I have certain you know, matrix kind of a thing where I have address lines coming from the left. I have maybe some kind of a data line coming from the top. And then 
Whereas these black dots that I have here, they are already been fixed by the manufacturer, but I could actually change, for example, the, uh, the so-called R terms. For example, I could say that uh, I could make it, uh, I want, you know, wherever I want to connect up a particular uh, line, I will connect up, and wherever I don't want, uh, let us say, uh, I don't want to connect up certain dots here, I will leave them open, which means the R is programmable, and the AND here, AND terms here are already coming from an industry when I buy. So these are already predetermined. These are something which I can program. Nevertheless, we used, uh, you know, something like what if this is made by Philips, for example, uh, these chips, they're very, very nice. And we could do some limited programming in, the, in our uh, office. Now you can also say the other way around, I will actually have programmable AND, but fixed or, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, one is, uh, programmable or another one is programmable and and uh, there are many chips which were made by Texas and we used to use and they were extremely uh, nice at that time. Now, if you tell me that uh, another configuration where there is a programmable and array the way you saw them here and I also have the programmable or array so both of them right so that is obviously combining both of them and I get a, a much better. Uh, functionality and also flexibility, uh, which are called programmable logic array, okay? Uh, now, I mean, this is how the whole history kind of moved forward. Uh, if you want to call them as a simple programmable logic devices, of course, you could go to the next level where you say, look, okay, that's fine. I have, I want to divide my entire, I see here it is made by let us say Altera, and where I will have all the logic that I want to do, where I want to put truth table, et cetera, or lookup tables. I'll have many logic blocks. I can have as many logic blocks as I want. And then I connect output of one to output to input of this, output of here, I want to connect to input of this. If whatever that I want to do, I want to program by these connections. Now I don't take wires and connect from here to here or here to here, but there are a set of uh, matrix of wires which I can kind of program. When I do all this, the real outputs or real inputs that I want to bring them to the IC, the way you saw them here, I can bring that as a pins of this. So it is, I mean, in a way it is more complex compared to the devices that you saw PLD and PLA, but it's a next generation of this. What is the best part about this? This chip, I can actually program in situ. What do you mean by in situ? In situ means I can mount this uh, chip on a board and then program as I like. And today maybe I'll put a, I'll put some logic here. Tomorrow I come out and uh, you know make a new logic and push that logic into this. The same chip will obviously work as different device. Now, as I said, there's nothing for you know hunger always. You know the next step therefore came to what many of you probably heard or what most of you might be even using the so-called field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs. Okay, these are again very similar. You can say in the next step up to CPLDs, uh, they will enable designers to program customized digital logic. Remember, when we said that there is an AND gate, AND gate is not customized. It is already given by the company, right? Whereas these logic, you will be able to program in the field. In the field, I mean, in your college, in your industry, in your company, whatever, right? Now, as I said, that as FPGAs has evolved from uh, useful but humble interface devices. Um, but the function of the such kind of devices can be defined after manufacturing. So it is like a canvas, a white canvas somebody give you, now you design and draw the things that you kind of want. So the FEJS will allow you to program real, you know, nice, nice, very nice product functions, features, and maybe use it to adopt new standards reconfigure the hardware, maybe for specific applications, even after the product is already been installed in the field. Right? What does it mean? I can design, a, let us say an internet hub, or maybe some device, I can sell it, maybe it is sitting in your house, okay? And using the interface that is there in the, on, the, on the web, maybe I can upgrade the firmware of your uh, product, which is sitting in your house, by sending a new firmware, and you know, put that in the FPGA so that the whole product that you built around an FPGA works much efficiently, much differently, and so on and so forth. So you can see, of course, 
uh, it brings a fantastic uh, you know in field programmability and it will also give a lot of lot of flexibility and uh, you know novel designs uh, to be implemented even way after the product is delivered to the customer so that is the big advantage very similar structure compared to what you saw in cpld here also you see logic blocks lots of lots of them and then there are routing matrix through which you interconnect logic from one logic block to another logic block and ultimately the outputs that you want to bring to pins where you want to actually solder on the board are also kind of done now there are of course large number of companies uh, rylings altera which is called now of course uh, intel and many other companies make uh, these uh, ch chips and there are plenty of such chips companies etc are available in the market you can go to market buy a chip there are tools available for you to kind of design and develop systems very very quickly using field program arrays yeah so this is the structure that i already kind of told you what i really want to tell you is many of the modern fpga allow you uh, this so called particular fabric the way it looks like a matrix of elements here all these programmable logic elements here and programmable interconnect so you program the logic inside and you also program the interconnection here and such several millions of logic blocks several millions of such logic blocks are available in each each fpga into which you can put in lots and lots and lots of discrete circuit so that is what actually makes a very very fine grain uh, matrix of logic blocks here so sometimes i don't know if you have heard about this word called lookup table lookup table is something where if this is my chip here and i i have a provision where i connect certain inputs in this case let us say i only have four inputs i mean of course that's just for example now using these four uh, inputs whatever logic that i want to connect up for example i want to uh, make a circuit y equal to a and b and let us say r of c or whatever right now i can always implement that by using a truth table where a b c are given here y is given here and this is called truth table this is like a truth table and the entire truth table i can put it inside this logic unit and when i provide various a b c d inputs i get the output the way i like i can also provide a clock you remember i told you for a register sometimes you want to use a clock i also mentioned to you maybe i want to use enable to get the output from here and so on maybe i can put a multiple i mean i can keep on uh, doing things at my will and wish and all that is programmable inside this building block so therefore it makes uh, for me extremely easy to develop new circuits by using uh look up table tape uh, you know what what we are all talking about here uh, but there's something very nice about uh, the field programmable gate arrays are i can put not just the basic digital logic but i can actually put so called processors what are processors the microprocessors microcontroller esp cpu gpus all these i can just take the entire core that is provided i can actually dump the entire thing inside an fpga this is fantastic because uh, typically microprocessors microcontrollers come with some certain speeds which are decided by the manufacturer of the microcontroller but if i push that logic into an fpga i can run the same uh, core architectures at much 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 higher uh, rate so what it means is fpgas are not just only digital building blocks but they also can be uh, embedded inside or the you know or the controllers through which i can program them and run like the way i run a microprocessor or microcontrollers right that is fantastic uh, you know upgrade in some sense so therefore you will find depending on which fpga you buy uh, there are so called soft processor why soft processors because unlike your 8085 z80 8086 and so on these are these are implemented by code inside right so they are they can be called soft core so depending on which uh, ic which xile which uh, manufacturer of fpga you buy uh, those those soft processors are available now that is what you can do in the field but even some of the companies since they are you know like pc440 or arm cortex or uh, you know other commonly used uh, processors are very very useful some people found some manufacturers found why to kind of wait until the chip goes to the market but why not i even pack the fpga already 
with a hard core processor right so if you like you already want to have a hard core processor already sitting in an fpga you can buy that or if you say no no i don't want this i want to build my own uh, soft processor okay go ahead and buy this so, so this is an additional functionality fpga devices provide uh, you know these fpga starting from you know early 80s where barely just about 60 70 flip flops and you know look up tables of the order of hardly about 128 you know, running at 18 megahertz and, you know, two micrometer, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, gate width, gate uh, uh, width, et cetera, available at scale. Today, we see large number of, uh, you know, FPGAs produced by Xilinx and Intel and or uh, Altera, which are at 16 nanometer technology. We see what it is very, 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 very soon. But imagine about 128 lookup tables. Today, we are talking about Three or four thousand into thousand. That means we are talking about four million uh, flip flops. We are talking about four million uh, you know, lookup tables. Here you are talking about 128, and you are talking about huge speeds of memory. You are you're talking about uh, you know very very high speed links at 100 gigahertz uh, Ethernet links. You are talking about trans receivers uh, going at a level of 128 Gbps. Right? These are very very top end. Uh, you know, FPGA devices which are available in the market. Of course, they're very expensive as of now, but if you want to build a very, very complex system on chip vendor devices, this is what you have today available to you, okay? Uh, uh, I just now mentioned here a word called FinFET. Some of you must have heard about it. Don't read this uh, big slide, but I just wanted to tell you FinFET is a, is a kind of configuration where the MOSFET, to which we all know about it, uh, you know, which has a source, gate, and drain. If I can build uh, on a substrate where gate is actually placed uh, across this channel, maybe all around this channel, either three times, three surfaces or four surfaces. So I'm actually forming, uh, I'm wrapping, you can say, the, the channel between source and drain using the gate, which is shown in red color here. And it actually forms like a fins of a fish. So that is how it is actually called. Uh, let us say uh, FinFET, and um, these are of course very very nice because they significantly make the devices extremely fast switching between source and drain, and they also increase the higher you know very, very high current density. Today you have FinFET technologies uh, which I mentioned to you here, 16 nanometer feature size, and uh, you know here of course one is talking about is Omega make uh, FinFET about 25 nanometer size, operating at about 0.7 volts. And what is the kind of speeds that I'm getting? Input to output delay is, you know, is a half a nanosecond level. You know, it's about 400 picoseconds level. That is the kind of, uh, you know, technologies that we are talking about, which are available today in the, in the, in the FinFET uh, technologies, okay? And all the modern uh, FPGAs are actually used uh, using this. Now, if you look at just one state-of-the-art Xilinx a zinc processor, ultra-scale processor, you can really see whatever you want, application processing units, real-time processing unit, all the memory that I want, the management unit, the configuration, the gra GPUs and you know, graphical processor interfaces, all the you know, interfaces for data, uh, both standard interfaces as well as specialized interfaces, very, very high speed. I told you just now, you know, hundreds of GPPS, uh, speeds, high-speed connectivity, all them, including programmable logic, the whole thing is like a system on chip is available from one particular device, okay? So there is no surprise because the kind of uh, resources that are available inside one FPGA will make you to build the whole high-end, high super uh, computer kind of thing on one chip. So these are the kind of state-of-the-art chips that you have. Now, we have been talking about programmability, but we didn't say, what do you mean by programmability? You know, if I can give a simple analogy, if I have two wires where, you know, either I want to connect these two wires here, or I want to break these two wires, you know, something like a fuse, which is similar to electrical fuse that we have in our house, right? Is something, a device that I can have. If I blow the fuse out, this wire get disconnected from it. If I actually install the fuse, this and this get shorted, which means this wire and this wire are actually get short. Now this is so-called anti-fuse technology. You could also use the flash technology where 
the, the base of the gate of a, a MOS device where I can actually control and which is like, you know, a, a electrically programmable read-only memory. All the drains, all the drains are, all the sources are connected, but I, I decide which should source, which source should get connected to which source based on whether I make uh, a, a, a MOS device on or off by this. This is something called flash device, which is actually not volatile, which means even if I switch off power, I can still maintain the status. Of course, this is uh, also not volatile because if I blow the fuse, it will remain blown. Or if I install fuse, it remain installed. There is also something very, very high speed uh, device. Instead of connecting like this, I can use a RAM, you know, bit, like, uh, like I can connect to a bit here. I can make a bit one, in which case the transistor comes on. I can put a zero here in which case the, the, the transistor goes off, right? So I can connect uh, the matrix by using, let us say, static RAM uh, to make or break. You remember we talked about logic cells, which are here, and we said the routing matrix are here, and routing matrices are placed using SRAM devices, which will be extremely fast, okay? But the problem is, you know, volatile. When I switch out the power, of course, the, the uh, the uh, the connection goes off, right? But I can reprogram. I can simply uh, put some data in the RAM that is connecting here, and the chip becomes a new chip, right? So that is these are so-called inter interconnect uh, switches. Based on these technologies, many of the man major manufacturers, whether you call it Xilinx or Intel, uh, as I said, this was Altera earlier, Microsemi, which was earlier called Actel or Lattice or whatever, and you can see that different uh, manufacturers use different techniques for you know, fusing or for programmability. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's up to you to choose which particular device you would like to use. And uh, some devices have a specific advantage compared to others. Some of them are so-called radiation sensitive, radiation hard rather, so good for probably space applications, something like this. For applications in industry, both Xilinx and Intel, of course, uh, they are quite uh, suitable. We talked sometime back about you know putting stuff inside an FPGA. Sometimes we call that as an intellectual property, right? Why? Because that can be something you can work on and you can put that in your own FPGA fabric and such a way that it can provide excellent functionality, right? So now if you build one such a nice architecture, you can probably sell it, you can actually, you know, trade it. You can, uh, you know, you can become an entrepreneur by actually selling the rights of such intellectual property, which of course is owned by you, and to maybe to other disco designers or maybe manufacturers of some of these uh, chips, and then uh, you know it will be great, right? And uh, you can see, you know, there are there is no limit for uh, what can be an IP. You can talk about memory, DRAM controllers, calculators, high-speed trans receivers, protocols, GPUs, DSPs. I mean, you name it, right? And so it is all in the brain, in the head of a designer and uh, younger people when they can make such a you know outstanding contributions by producing really really novel architectures for many of the FPGA chips and that really becomes uh, something you know uh, a, a way by which you can actually have a very very high commercial values and we talked about the hard IPs and soft IPs already so one of the big opportunity for young people to work in the VLSI and FPGA areas is the IPR development. Okay, uh, you remember in the beginning, we did talk about application-specific integrated IC. Uh, later on, we also started talking about FPGAs. A little bit of comparison between them. Uh, as we said, you know, uh, the ASICs, uh, once you design everything for your application, it becomes fully custom built. Uh, so it becomes like a chip that you buy from market. But FPGA, we realized that, you know, you can program it. The density of what you can build here is a little lower. Complexity is limited. The speed is also much better in ASIC compared to here. Of course, FPGAs are, offer uh, flexibility, so they consume more power, but here it's less power. They occupy more space, less space, and so on and so forth. But remember one thing, it takes a lot of time for ASICs to be built because it's very complicated to design and get them fabricated by foundries. And FPGAs are something which you can buy from market and you know they are easily available to you and you can program them program them. So you can develop them very fast and here it will be a little, you know, takes more time. So if you want to build some systems in small number, I think it is great if you use a system using FPGAs, but if you want to build in, you know, thousands and millions of units, 
then you know building your own essay and fabricating them even though it cost uh, initially for uh, designing but per chip it will cost much less so depending on what is your application either you will go with fpga or asic okay and once you actually have fpgas when you want to program them you, you use what is called hardware description language unlike your you know fortran or c or pascal or whatever these languages are actually not talking to computer but they're actually talking to uh, you know hardware so that's why they're called hdls and many of you probably learned in your college what is called very high speed integrated circuit hardware called vhdl or verilog uh, modern days you know many of us use what is called vivado which is a high level language even more higher level than these two languages and i can actually implement this logic in a very ordinary programming languages and uh, you know the vivado actually converts them into uh, the hdls and then you know i can download it into my fpga chip so no matter what if you are working or planning to work on vlsi uh, you have to learn one of the hdls or hardware description languages okay uh, the generic cycle generic sequence when you want to design or develop a let us say an asic chip you know is uh, something very common so you actually start with an idea and uh, list down all the specifications and start from design you want to design the overall architecture then you go to register level transfer logic which you have sometimes is called rtl and after that you want to ensure that this logic is exactly like what you are aiming for your uh, you know uh, logic otherwise if you produce a chip which is uh, based on a wrong uh, logic then obviously it will be waste of money and time so you verify using the tools so you put together now all these building blocks together which is called synthesis and then go to a foundry uh, and then say this is my logic this is my rtl code okay i finished all the validation synthesis etc please go and manufacture a chip for me and you know the company will give you fabricate the chip and uh, you know that is something what you can call that application specific integrated circuit but as i said sometimes it happens maybe the first version that you use you bought or you manufactured it may not be serving your purpose probably maybe you have to make some revisions before it becomes available for you uh, for the purpose that you are kind of saying now when you when you when you talk about that that saying that you know like uh, what is that i am trying to uh, i am trying to kind of make uh, such a such a device uh, then the question comes is how how these uh, one second i actually trying to run a uh, a video for you but uh, okay so uh, since this is this is the process that i kind of mentioned to you uh, i also wanted to tell you how such a device gets fabricated in the market right so when you say this is the so called single crystal which is usually silicon uh, that is what is grown and then it is sliced into the wafers right we all call silicon wafers these are very thin slices and then you kind of process each one of them and uh, you know make sure that the wafers are ready to take the integrated circuit these are called masks mask is a device mask is a kind of thing that you build based on your digital logic usually there are 10 12 14 different masks masks are like films in a pcb and then using one by one using a technique called optical lithography then you start depositing the circuits or you know build the circuits that you want remember no matter how many billions of transistors that you have on 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 a wafer you really literally have to build one transistor at a time right one transistor at a time you have to build you have to etch you have to fill you have to pack all these are done by what i call you know very very high precision fine uh, you know lasers nowadays that's why this whole process is called optical lithography optical lithography is by which based on what device i want to build what is the my base size collector size emitter size you know what are the pads that i have and how uh, each one of them is going to kind of operate based on that i have to literally build one gate by gate at a time using the lasers so once i am able to build one i can easily replicate large number of them i can interconnect all these uh, uh, let us say transistors together and this is very similar to what we do on a printed circuit board connecting wires from one to another and when i build the entire uh, wafer okay and you can see that each one of this rectangle here is one chip so i do cut it like the way i cut like a pizza 
and uh, you know what is called a die scene. So each one of them is actually for me is a chip, package it uh, into an integrated circuit and then supply to you where you can actually make a printed circuit board. Remember, making one such chip uh, in a factory takes months together, starting from making a single crystal to you know coming and delivering one integrated IC for you, right? So that is the journey of an integrated circuit. I want to take for five minutes into digression and show how we uh, working in uh, you know basic science and building detectors which are supposed to do physics, but how do we work and design our own uh, VLSI chips, yeah, ASIC chips used with FPGAs? So I'll take five minutes to kind of give a feel for it. Uh, these are some of the detectors. You don't have to know what they are. These are actually meant for doing some basic physics. But what is important for you, of course, these are very gigantic, very, very big detectors. You know, they're almost five storied building height and uh, each detector weighs about 50,000 tons. But for you and me, what is important is from such a detector, what are the kind of electronic devices or functions that I need to record? What is the data that I need to record? You can see on the left side, I have listed certain functional blocks. Some of them probably will make sense to you because you can read them. And this is what only when you record all this data from that detector that I've shown, then we'll be able to do the physics that I want to do. Once I finalize this, I go and of course, on a, maybe on a blackboard, I'll try to see, okay, what is my overall architecture of my electronics? And then I get down to kind of divide the entire electronics into top-down approach. This is my detector here, and I want to design some front-end, let us say an amplifier and uh, comparators and so on. Maybe I'll plan some ASIC here. I want to do a lot of processing, digital processing here. Maybe I'll use a huge FPGA device. Maybe I'll make the entire thing into a circuit board, which also use some more ASICs. The data that is coming out, I'll put it on a network. And maybe I will use some other system called trigger and so on. And I replicate this maybe 30,000 times, million times, and because that my detector is very, very big. And I want to make electronics which can take uh, you know, all this functionality. Of course, when I want to even design a simple amplifier, something similar to what you may be making in your uh, lab, I use with discrete components, right? But that you can see it is very big and it actually consumes a lot of power. And if I kind of mini make that as a mini scroll by actually making very small resistors, very small capacitors and put it inside a small PCB with a ducker on the top and so on, this is what is called HMC. It's called hybrid microcircuit. This is much smaller than the board that you saw, but still it is, you know, it consumes a lot of power. What I really want to do is I want to design various components like, you know, this is trans impedance amplifier, differential amplifier, comparator, driver, multiplexer, and whatever, whatever. I want to design this circuit on paper, what I require for my experiment, and then go ahead and say, I want to build an application specific integrated circuit. I mean, what you see, there are four chips here, which are actually manufactured in using what is called a QFN package. And I can use those chips in my printer circuit board and then build very, very high speed circuitry. So these chips are not what you buy from market, but these are chips that you build based on your own logic here, and then go to a foundry, maybe somewhere abroad, European foundry maybe, and get them built. And of course, I you can also make the circuits extremely complicated. If the functionality of modern amplifiers are such, you know, that it of course becomes very complex. But I want to tell you, look at all the basic elements that are inside. They're nothing but transistors and some passive components. And But when you make it to an ASIC, I will be, of course, able to use in my circuit board, not only analog ASICs, I can also make digital ASICs. For example, this particular chip made by a student can give you measure time difference between two events at a level of 125 picoseconds. Picoseconds is 10 for minus 12 seconds. You can see that extremely, extremely fine, uh, you know, resolution devices, which are also made with application specific integrated ICs. And then when we build such kind of circuits, one of them, for example, this is called switched capacitor array. As the name says, I give my signal here, which is a waveform. That waveform is stored in different capacitors for short period. And after all the, after the waveform is propagated completely, then the charge that is held in this each capacitor, I will be reading it. And then, you know, that is my waveform. 
analyzer. So you can actually see that uh, the input waveform is going here. And for every 200 picoseconds that is stored across a capacitor, after everything is finished, I go and ask one capacitor at a time, please give me what is the voltage that you have or what is the charge that you are holding. And I measure by what is called a flash ADC. And you can see this is the waveform that I given. And this is the waveform I have reconstructed. I'll be able to kind of use such kind of application specific integrated ICs when you build a very massively big systems. And so this is again what you call a switched capacitor array, but built by ourselves, not bought from market, uh, which I can use to sample at five or six giga samples per second. That means at every 200 picoseconds, one fourth of a nanosecond, I can have a new sample and then you know I can use it. I can also connect those kind of chips using an FPGA device and make an entire data acquisition system very, very compact and very fast. So I have the waveform digitizer here, and then I connect them by using, uh, for example, uh, uh, an FPGA-based system, and I store the data in the static RAM and so on. This is how we build our electronics using ASICs and FPGAs. And when you talk about an FPGA, you can, of course, put the whole sort of logic inside one FPGA. These are all building blocks inside. Sometime back, I told you that you can even put a microcontroller units inside an FPGA. You can really see the entire thing is integrated into one. The time to digital converter ASIC that we talked about is here. The temperature, humidity sensors, the waveform analyzer, which I told you, uh, you know, switched capacitor arrays here, the buffers, the flash ADC, and the data comes out on an ethernet onto here, right? Everything is built in into a small board. You remember I talked to you sometime back about the soft core processors. I can program the entire thing like a microprocessor. I can actually write a C, a C or C++ code, compile it and put that uh, code inside and it can interface to all my devices that I have on the, on the data. On the, I can connect a JTAG, I can connect SPI, I can connect uh, the TDC, internet, you know, real-time uh, clock, memory, and you name anything, and I'll be able to handle everything by using the code, which I written, just like the people, the way you write for a microcontroller. When I finish all that and make it to a simple board, uh, so this is where the ASIC is, this is where the FPJ is, this is where the data comes out on, a, on an Ethernet board. So it becomes very compact, and I can even put fiber on it. I can actually then transfer data to 10 Gbps, and uh, the same device becomes extremely, extremely fast, uh, you know, uh, interface. Uh, important thing is when we build such a big circuits, but they, they occupy very little space compared to the entire, you know, each detector. So it's very important because you don't want to occupy a lot of space with electronics. Another example is about a particle accelerator that we work on at Geneva. This is a big accelerator going between, you know, between two countries, that is Switzerland and uh, France and the particles you know, oscillate, uh, uh, revolve around. And when they come close and when they hit with each other, they produce large number of particles. This particular detector has uh, discovered what is called Higgs boson or what sometimes you must have heard about God particle. Now these detectors are also, you can see how big they are. Look at this person here compared to that. These are extremely uh, massive devices. And when we build data acquisition systems for 20 million electronic channels, we have to use a large number of, this is the architecture of the entire system, but we use ASICs in the digital electronics, in the front ends, uh, readout modules, readout, uh, you know, builder, uh, readout builder networks, and everything really becomes a compact system when you use VLSI logic inside, okay? And that is how starting from the detector all the way to get the data on a computing node with the petabytes of archive, this is only possible because we use very, very high speed devices, uh, you know, very, very compact FPGA devices and uh, assets. In fact, this is a vertex FPGA made by Xilinx. You can really see using that, we are able to compute a lot of computation inside and we also use for communication using such kind of uh, interfaces which can be used for, you know, 20, 30 gigabits per second. We also use, uh, you know, TPUs, GPUs, all of them are actually programmed inside so this entire board, even though it looks so simple, so small, it has almost a power of a supercomputer. This is all built with, this is one and this is another, just two FPGAs. 
the rest of it is all very simple logic. So this is the power of computers built with FPGAs. Olden days, even initial stages of FPGAs, we used to use many FPGAs together, connect them like a network, transfer data from one FPGA to another FPGA for computation. But as I told you now, you have such a large scale Altera or Intel FPGA, everything that you see here gets sub subsumed inside. And now we are talking about a bandwidth of the level of not gigabits per second, but one terabytes per second. So that is the kind of high speed links that you can build using just, just one chip, okay? Of course, we all know Moore's law and the whole electronics that you see today are actually, uh, you know, every two years, uh, the density of these chips are getting doubling up, the cost is coming down. And thanks to this man who had this vision 50 years back, how uh, the number of transistors produced per year increase and how the cost per chip cost per transistor comes down uh, every year. So this is how we are still following as far as VLSI are concerned, Moore's law. And the way this Moore's law works here is basically what is called scaling. You know, we know that if you take a resistance of a conductor, we say R equal to rho L by A. Now, if I take a small integrated circuit or a chip whose size is like four by four by certain thickness, now, if I want to make this chip smaller, I can actually decrease, instead of making four by four, I can make two by two, and still the characteristics of the, for the same row, the resistance will be still same. This is a simple principle which we learned in Ohm's law, is the same one that is today used when you want to make planar devices to shrink, you know, sometimes it is called uh, basically shrinking the size, feature size, and that is how you are able to kind of make if I reduce the length and if I reduce the width, okay, the resistance is going to be the same of the chip. So therefore, people are able to starting from, you know, when I was born, it was like, you know, almost a few hundred, uh, you know, 20, 30 micron meter uh, feature size. Feature size is the size of a transistor. Okay, now today we are here, roughly we are talking about 10 to 12 nanometer size. And you can really see, that the size of each transistor is coming down almost linearly with the time. And uh, very soon, of course, we'll be reaching to the quantum level and atomic dimensions, okay. So these developments are what is actually fueling VLSI uh, technologies said. That is what I call challenges for technology scaling. Scaling means making the chips smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Okay, so the main problem with this, what is really happening is one of the big challenges when you reduce the size, when you increase the speed of the device, the power consumption of these chips becomes extremely important. So lowering power consumption is important, not only for lengthening the battery life, because these are all operated with battery. Obviously, if I consume less power, then I'll be able to run this circuit for a long period. But if I use less power, the circuit also becomes very, very reliable. So therefore, the power consumption is a dramatic problem nowadays. There are lots of VLSI engineers only work with power, low power devices, right? So low power design in terms of algorithms, architectures, circuits, now received significant attention today. And these are the uh, important aspects. In fact, some of you may know, for example, Facebook, uh, the way they cool the servers uh, is a fantastic uh, technique by which you can work on the thermal management, okay? Um, of course, VLSA circuits are used in many, many, uh, uh, you know, fields, you can see I have listed consumer electronics, wireless electronic device, medical electronics, automobile, aerospace, defense, you name it. They're all available today. And uh, there are lots and lots of opportunities, both in the industries based on function, sometimes, you know, product-based company, you know, whether you are selling uh, which kind of product based on the VLSS circuit. After you build the product, of course, uh, service also becomes very, very important. So based on which kind of VLSI industry that you are interested in, there are many opportunities. One of them, of course, as we said, electronic design automation uh, uh, tools companies, which are like Synopsys, Cadence, Mentor, and Xilinx. There are ASIC design companies like Texas, Intel, Cisco, Xilinx. We saw that some of these. There are also FPJ design companies, which are, again, Xilinx, Altera, Intel, and things like that. And there are also foundries. You remember we talked about once you fabricate a design, you want to actually make the chip, right? There are very few famous big foundries in the world. Intel is one of them, STM. 
uh, in IBM, is, you know, it's TSMC, UMC, Texas Instruments, Samsung, et cetera, the very few of them. Uh, but depending on what you really want to uh, you know, aim at in VLSI, there are so-called design engineers who actually work on the ASIC or front-end front -end designers, the main core designers, or you can talk about the verification designers, which means engineers, after somebody designed this, uh, uh, the front end, somebody need to verify it. So verification engineers are as smart or as intelligent as design engineers. And then you want to actually now design using the ED and CAD engineers, bringing that design into actual product, okay? And then uh, you apply application engineers, once, once I build an ASIC, what are the kind of applications I can think of? Only when the application field is very rich, those chips will be able to be sold, right? So these are application engineers. And finally, the technical support engineers. It is not something uh, to be looked down because in modern days, VLSI technical support engineers are also extremely well paid and uh, they're also much sought after. But once again, depending on what you want to become, obviously you also have to come with the big uh, skill sets. You know, if you want to work with front-end design engineers, you have to have very, very proficient digital electron design, uh, good at the so-called RTL coding. You remember we talked about, you have to be really good at uh, HDL, VHDL, very log system, sketch pair, test bench writing using HDL, and you know, whole a lot of, whole a lot of uh, uh, qualifications. For a CAD engineer, mostly people talk about high level languages like C, C++, uh, idea about data structure, Java uh, debugger, and understanding about ASIC and FPGAs. Actual physical designer, as we said, we require uh, knowledge about the tools, uh, tools like Cadence, Magma, Synopsis, the backend tools that are required, and you know how you can design from digital circuit to transistor level design translation, okay? The entire floor planning, you know, remember we saw when we saw that video, how you interconnect various transistors into together, reducing the clock delays and so on. And uh, verification engineers, as I said, are as good as design engineers so that you need to understand. But one of the very, very uh, difficult technique to understand is what is called clock tree synthesis without the clocks being synthesized uh, from various real estate of the chip the chips will not simply work at high frequencies. So expertise on CTS is a big, big uh, uh, qualification. Uh, so um, you might ask towards the end of my talk, so you might ask, say, you know, what we have to study or what you have to get trained in order to get a very nice job in LSI. Of course, you have to have a very solid, good understanding as an undergraduate degree, preferably in electronics and communication or electronics or computer science engineering or an MSc in electronics because I skipped one or two slides where a lot of foundry and lithography is being taught as a basic science, not so much as, as an engineering. So MSc electronics is also is extremely good uh, uh, qualification. Post-graduation in a very reputed academic institution in VLSI design, application simulations, HDLs, just now what I talked to you, application sensors, we skipped some part of it, but remember this is an important thing. Maybe we'll say a few words after this. Silicon detector technology and so on. So having a very solid uh, post-graduation, I think makes uh, completely prepared for you, not just only undergraduation. But if you are seriously talking about taking this as a research or academic career, of course you can't do without a PhD. And if you do, of course, fantastic, you know, a good internship in one of the chip manufacturing companies or fabrication companies or so-called, you know, fabless companies or something that will add a good uh, weight for your uh, CV and industry. And it will also steepen your scope of expertise. And this will, of course, ensure your past and excellent career. You believe me, these days, uh, the VLSI engineers are really, really are paid uh, fantastic pay packages, provided, of course, you are completely you know, provide, get your skill set that are required for here. Even in India, uh, there are quite a few laboratories under uh, government of India based. Okay, there are ISRO, of course, they have their own foundry at Semiconductor Complex Limited at Chandigarh. Some of the chips that they make are shown here. Uh, defense, uh, they have their own uh, stuff at in Hyderabad mostly, called Anurag, uh, it's a DRDO. Department of Atomic Energy from where I come from, uh, there are also uh, fantastic, uh, what you call, opportunities 
for chip uh, level design and fabrication, et cetera, uh, in BRC and CMEMS. Uh, the Bharat Electronics in Bangalore also has many uh, facilities for chips as well as detector manufacturing, ITI in Bangalore, ECL in Hyderabad, and so on. Uh, these are uh, government of India uh, companies, you can say institutions, which are also doing exceedingly well in this area. Some of them may not be as good as the top level companies in the world, but you know, if you want to get some opportunity within India, uh, these are one of the opportunities where you can try. Um, I also told you there are large number of multinational companies. Nowadays, they have their big presence in India. ST Microelectronics is one of them. Texas Instrument is one of the oldest companies which have actually had their design house in Bangalore, in India. Synapses, Cadence, Mentor, Xilinx, all of them have now what you call fabulous chip makers. What do you mean? They have huge design houses in India uh, for fabricating, for uh, actually designing the chips, when the entire chip is ready, you, of course, the designs go to their facilities in US, Europe, Southeast Asian countries where actual chips are produced. So this is a great opportunity for people, even without crossing the shore of this country, you can be situated in this country, but still work on the top companies of the, uh, of this VLSI companies in the, in the country. So remember this, and you can Google them. Uh, you'll find opportunities. I do have slides, but since I'm running out of time, I'm not showing them here. Uh, one of the, uh, just a couple of things I just want to tell you before I close my talk. What are there for you? Two main areas, apart from what I was telling about is so-called integrated data acquisition system, which means normally we are all used to doing, you know, sensors or transducers, and they are connected to electronics the way we implement them. But now what is coming out, since sensors are mostly made of silicon, of course, electronics is made of silicon, can I actually combine them, integrating them together, and then let us say, build them all together using silicon. So that means this silicon chip here is actually bonded uh, immediately to the silicon chip here, which is actually readout chip. So this is the sensor, which is actually producing signals. Uh, if an X-ray is passing through the signal, this is used in the medical imaging. The signal that is produced is amplified, you know, compared or counted or whatever. So this is also is made of silicon, and this is also is made of silicon. So I make a very, very low noise, very low power, and extremely compact, uh, you can say, sensors plus electronics put together. This is now the new field that is coming up, and it is possible that some of you will be very much interested to get into such kind of uh, you know, new fields of microelectronics, okay? Another one I want to come to you, you all, this is the last slide in, before I get into my conclusion. We all hear about, you know, so-called VGTs, which are so-called current control because I give a base current and I talk about collector current, right? This is transistor we call about. We also study what you call FETs, field effect transistors, where, I apply a voltage, this is controlling this uh, device. And of course I get the, the current, which is in terms of uh, what is coming from source to drain. So this is driven by current and output is also current. This is driven by voltage, but output is current. But did we ever think about that? Can I actually put current in, in, in it and actually get voltage out, which we don't have as of now. Okay, this is sometimes called Hall effect which came from electromagnetism, but these are now called transsetters, not trans and resistor, and this is trans and capacitor, okay? And similarly, can I give a voltage the way I'm giving in a field effect transistor, and can I get voltage output? This is also something like an electromagnetic effect, but we don't have this here. We don't have this here today. So just like transistors, which are transis transfer of resistance, no change of resistance here, can I actually build a transciter, which is transfer of capacitance? We don't have these devices now. They're actually in the r and state, but maybe these are the ones which some of you might work. And believe me, these transciters are extremely useful to make much more compact the VLSI devices than they are built with transistors. So these are you know, two of the, I can say, futuristic areas. Maybe some of you will get inspired and excited 
to work on it. So that brings me to the last slide, which is my uh, summary slide. Uh, the micro and microelectronics technologies, as I said, is concurrently making great progress and increasing the finding it new application. Now, very, very compact, very, 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 you know, deep my submicrons in nanometer technologies are helping packing billions of transistors in one small chip, potentially running them at, you know, gigahertz frequencies. They're also facilitating uh, very good novel architectures and sensors, which we just talked at the end. So the number of transistors per chip and also the clock frequencies are making it them very, very high, high performance microprocessors and programmable logic devices. But the challenge for you, the younger generation is, as the technology scales, which means the chips are becoming small, new opportunities are coming for VLSI IC manufacturing, the so-called MEMS and NEMS, which are sensors and actuators. So therefore, understanding these technology trends and particular application is the main criteria for designing efficient, effective chips. So there are many difficult and but also exciting challenges facing uh, the design of complex chips for you. So to continue this phenomenal historical growth and continue to follow Moore's law, you remember the way the chip size comes down year after year, the semiconductor industry will require advances in all fronts. It is not only front end process, it's lithography, I told you, where by using laser, you etch very, very fine transistors to design innovation about which we talked about, high performance processors and system on chip solution. These are all, I would say, real challenges for you. There are also real you know, opportunities for you. So Indian industry, as well as you guys, okay, younger people, you can't lag for a long time. We already lag compared to many other advanced countries in this particular microelectronics. So with that, I would like to kind of thank all of you for your attention, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yes, yes, uh, It was really a nice session from your side. Now we'll uh, just have some quick uh, questions from the comment section which uh, participants have posted. Sure. Sure. So can you uh, switch back to your uh, webcam? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, give me a second. Uh, so, you want me to take the unshare this? Stop sharing this? Yes. Okay. Done. Uh, okay, sir. Is that what you want or you want full screen? Fine, sir. Okay. The first question is, in this current situation, what is the scope of yeah. this yeah. domain in India? Well, uh, uh, you saw that I have, uh, towards the end, I have shown uh, a few slides uh, to that effect. I was actually telling that um, there are many industries, including uh, some of them which are on the, even in the government sector, who are able to, uh, who are actually uh, manufacturing many of the VLSI chips may not be at a level, may not be at a feature level, feature size that are available in the state of the art, but uh, they also provide excellent uh, opportunities for early career in the country where, you know, if someone wants to kind of get trained in those technologies. But of course, at some point of time, uh, when uh, they get expertise, they can go and actually join another bigger uh, state-of-the-art uh, companies elsewhere, right? So that is something which are very much possible. There are also uh, government of India uh, companies or, uh, you know, institutions or uh, private sector where uh, there are basically design houses. Design houses means they're using VLSI chips and producing, uh, let us say, systems which are extremely compact and uh, also very, very, very high-speed systems. So there are uh, there are opportunities where, which are applications of VLSI, FPGAs, and uh, you know uh, CPLDs, FPGAs, and ASICs. But there are also, uh, let us say, manufacturing houses where, uh, especially the chips in terms of ASICs uh, or other uh, you know sensors, MEMS, NEMS, and actuators, etc., are also getting made. So both these 
Uh, some of them I have shown uh, in my presentation. Uh, but there are also MNCs, which are also now have their big design houses, design offices in the country. I think that is the best opportunity uh, for young people to aspire to. But at, having said that, it is also important that they work on towards equipping themselves, uh, having a good CV, which means they should also equipping themselves with that skill sets that are required. Okay, sir. The next question, uh, is there any program or course so that we can learn about building ICs? Oh yeah, plenty. In fact, many manufacturing, uh, many, uh, you know, the chip manufacturers and also the design houses, which are, I told you, Altera, or which is Intel, Xilinx, um, and also the foundries, many of them, which I told you, like, you know, SM Electronics, uh, and all these companies do offer, uh, in fact, very, very, uh, what you call, very, very intense, I would say, uh, specialized courses, which are meant for, let us say, students or professionals who already have certain knowledge by way of passing through their undergraduations, specializing them in the postgraduate uh, courses, and professionals who are already joined some companies but would like to switch over to uh, like designing the uh, let us high performance chips and so on. So all the all these uh, companies do offer uh, you know uh, courses for uh, people to do kind of further study their. Uh, 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 you know, knowledge in these areas, both chip building as well as design. Okay, so the next question is, uh, if one wants to... By the way, there are also, there are also courses which are, uh, you know, so-called online. I mean, you can also attend some of them. There may not be face-to-face -face courses. A large number of them, they're also available. Some of them have to be paid, but uh, they're available online. Okay, sir. Uh, so yeah. Next question is, if uh, one wants to pursue his or her career in this field, uh, sir, can you suggest how to go about? Well, I think again, I I did uh, uh, mentioned like point by point what are required in one of my slides towards the end. I did say that you must have a very, very good undergraduate degree. Very good, I mean, is really uh, the degree that shows that you are exceedingly doing well in the digital electronics, VLSI, you know, HDL, and all those uh, fundamentals that are required in terms of what a VLSI is. Uh, I mean, you have to really show, you really show by your grade sheets that you are actually a, a bright student uh, in, uh, in, in an undergraduation. Okay, now, but that's not enough, as I said, you also must do a PG in these areas, either VLSI design or fabrication, or silicon detector technology, or HDLs, or applications, or sensor, uh, either in India or abroad, right? And that's good enough if you really want to get on to doing a good job because your CV, by the time, hopefully, you'll also have a couple of good internships in a reputed institutions or industries so that that will add that here is a good academic career. At the same time, you also have a good knowledge about because you have actually worked on reputed uh, institutions. Now, if you want to really settle into a research or academic career in this area, of course, a PhD is required. Okay, uh, but otherwise, you know, this is this is the basic uh, qualifications that are required. And if you remember, I had categorized and I have mentioned to you uh, various uh, uh, job opportunities in BLSI. Okay, starting from design engineers to technical support. But I also given you for each of those opportunities what is the skill set. What are the requirements? What are the qualifications that one requires? So, I mean, you have to work to a plan. You cannot really, uh, you know, barely pass your digital electronic circuits uh, course or VLSA course or, you know, barely have any knowledge about these things and you can't take, aspire to become, uh, you know, uh, a, a take up a big job in VLSA. But having said that, it's also important that you must really have a goal towards working. It doesn't matter even if you're for example, undergraduation is not so nice, but if you really equip later by a good skill set in one of those, okay, which will also put you on a on a fast track, right? Imagine, I mean, nobody will give you a million dollar uh, job without themselves getting satisfied that you are actually going to build, you know, bring billion dollars to them, right? So this is ultimately it comes to commerce. 
Yes, sir. The next question. What are the recent yeah. trends in FPGA technology? Uh, recent boards, FPGA boards in use. Well, okay. Once again, uh, I did uh, kind of uh, went over and kind of I hope I gave you uh, some feel for uh, what the uh, latest, uh, you know, state of the art is in, in, in those areas. Uh, but I'm not sure maybe you kind of missed some of them. Uh, as I said, both Xilinx and Altera, these are the two major uh, companies. And both of them are actually bringing uh, what you call families after families of uh, new classes of FPGA devices. Uh, what 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 do you mean by that? Uh, I meant they are actually bringing, uh, for example, their uh, what you call feature sizes. Now you are able to package much much larger uh, number of billions of transistors into smaller chip. They are also becoming very fast. Uh, because the clock speeds are at much, much higher uh, higher speed, they're able to be operated. And uh, so therefore, uh, no, in fact, I gave you uh, ultra scale, so-called ultra scale devices, which means they're extremely small feature size devices uh, by using, uh, because they also come with billions and millions of uh, logic units and uh, lookup tables, basically flip-flops and so on and so forth, which is allowing you, for example, to build system on chip kind of device uh, entire system on one one single chip right uh, but what is i think also very very important i must tell you is that uh, they are also able to come with very very high speed uh, communication links because nowadays it is not just the chip uh, what you do computation inside the chip that matters it is also important that having done computation within my chip, how fast I'll be able to communicate to the chip outside. Now, if I have a very fast chip, but my communication links are very slow, then it is not helping. But you saw that uh, some of the chips that I had, uh, I think I had shown, they come with serial links, which can go to few hundred gigabits per second, which means I can transfer data from one FPGA to another FPGA at a level I cannot even imagine. Right, I'm talking about uh, you know the trans receivers operating at 128 giga by a gigabits per sorry uh, something like 30 or 40 gigabits per second, but I have 20, you know something like 100 or 200 such individual lines, so I can connect them very fast. I had actually shown you like a matrix where earlier you required many independent FPGAs operating and talking to each other. Now everything comes under one chip. Okay, so these are uh, I would say uh, the modern uh, FPGAs, which are coming in the you know so-called Intex families or uh, uh, ultra-scale families, uh, they are all at a level of you know 10, 20 nanometer technologies. Yes, uh, the zinc processors and uh, vortex processors and so on. But yes, there are also uh, as and when a company builds and uh, manufactures an FPGA, they also come with uh, trainer boards uh, which has these chips built in. And, uh, you know, just like olden days, you had this microprocessor uh, trainer boards or microprocessor uh, trainer boards. You could also have these training boards, which will make you familiar with how to program an FPGA, how to run applications, how to build hardware and so on. The best way to do this is to actually buy a trainer kit and then start learning. Okay. And by the way, for most of you, when you start learning, uh, the so-called EDA tools actually come free. Uh, the web version, which will come as free tool for you, you can actually use it to do lots of things. You don't need a proprietary licensed version to, to start with. So the last question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. FPGA, compare FPGA with FinFETs, and what is FPAA? FPA. Uh, I don't know what FPA is. Okay. okay. Uh, 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 but I can. Uh, uh, what, what uh, the comparison between FPGA and FinFET. No, no, it's, it's not, not a comparison. Uh, uh, FPGAs utilize uh, transistors inside, right? We actually started from describing what a basic building block is, okay? And we said that 
basic building element basic element of any digital electronics is of course is a simple transistor of course which has emitter emitter uh, you know collector and uh, base of course we also have uh, fets field effect transistors right which have typically very very uh, you know let us say vjts and fets which is fets are more voltage controlled devices vjts are current controlled devices now uh, if i now only talk about fets FinFETs are an advanced versions of FET devices. In what way they are advanced uh, compared to normal FET devices? Yeah, as you know, FETs has field effect transistors have, just like uh, PJT, it has uh, three terminals. One is source, brain, and uh, gate, right? Now, what FinFET does is, around the gate uh, structure, the gate is nothing but like a structure connecting source and uh, drain, I actually, build across a gate which is not just one on one surface but i can you know if i take like a pipe i can cover with one side one side two sides three sides or all four sides right now depending on how many sides i cover i will be actually having forming something like a double gray gate structure these are called fin because they are like you know something like fins of a fish now it will help me by having a larger gate volume or area i'll be able to have much higher current density right and it will improve the speed of signal going from let us say source to drain compared to ordinary fat device so that means fin fat is an advanced fat and fat itself is an element of an, one of the one one billionth of an element of an fg okay by using fats instead of fin fats instead of normal fats i can increase the speed of the device to you know maybe like you know few hundred picoseconds kind of input to output so therefore uh, finfet is a technology of the basic element using which you are actually going to make uh, fvgs so finfet is not comparison with fvga but finfet is a, is a device uh, is a basic uh, switching device uh, using which billions of uh, or thousands of lakhs of which to make an effigy. Yeah, sir, uh, that's it with the questions which were jotted down from the comment section. Uh, so, would you like to okay. say something to our participants? Okay. okay. Uh, uh, well, I uh, I understand that, uh, I mean, of course, this is uh, um, organized, you know, the talk is organized by the student branch of uh, Don Bosco College of Engineering. And uh, of course, the branch controller counselor is uh, right now here and talking uh, to you all and organizing things. And I'm sure behind him, uh, there must be a big team of uh, uh, student volunteers uh, who must be making this possible. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things which I didn't say uh, in, in my technical lecture as such. Uh, of course, uh, this is about IEEE. Uh, IEEE is making uh, all this technical dissemination of such information possible. It is making you connect up to experts in various technologies and engineering and education and science and all the fields. And there are also uh, opportunity where uh, you know you are able to kind of inculcate certain uh, certain habits which are not so otherwise uh, possible in terms of, for example, when you take up uh, paper writing, research paper writing, publishing papers. Uh, you know, developing leadership skills. Uh, for example, as I said, many of the people, students who are there today organizing these things, apart from their technical expertise, they're also understanding how to organize, how to lead, how to, you know, build personalities, how to build communication skills and so on and so forth. So IEEE is one such forum, as you know, this is the world's largest uh, professional body, right? About more than 400,000. Uh, members, professional members, and uh, I mean, who is who of uh, the world top uh, scientists, engineers, technocrats, everybody is part of IEEE. And uh, by, by I think being part of IEEE, uh, you are making yourself uh, visible and felt uh, to, to much, much wider community, right? And uh, even if you talk about purely technical perspective, depending on what is your field of interest, there is so much uh, opportunities for conferences. About 2,000 conferences are held every year by IEEE. 
where you can you know attend you can contribute you can learn a lot of it and when your papers are published in so called ipcc explore right ipcc explore is a huge repository of you know 3 to 4 million technical papers are available to you it will have access to you where when you when you download and when you read it it will give you not only just you know somebody asked what is fan fact uh, fin fact right now fin fact is just a technology which is coming on the horizon i talked to you integrated sensors and integrated uh, you know electronics i talked to you about transistors instead of transistor these are these are the you know the cutting edge fields and technologies that are coming up where do you get this from you if you read these papers coming out of ipcc uh, explore and ipcc conferences you will be the first one to come abreast with what's happening today you you will not be you know somebody who laid back and don't know what's happening in the field of technology which you opted for so i think it is a vast canvas on which you can perform you can technically benefit you can benefit from personality development you can benefit from your, your visibility your employment opportunities your societal status your profile you name anything and today you know all these students who are there you see them starting with as a student volunteer or secretary or chair or whatever of your college and you keep tracking them they actually grow in the in a in another body called you know so called bombay section to which your college comes in maybe uh, let us say india council to which all these sections come in and uh, they fall into a region into which all these sections and countries fall in and similarly go to headquarters there is a huge growth technical growth i'm talking about Uh, even for people who are aspiring to become technology leaders and there is also what is called you know for example just one small field you know what is called standards okay every time you talk about you know you talk about ieee standards if you talk about ethernet there is what is called 802 dot you know standard there are thousands of standards in communication electronics computers and you name anything these are all responsibly done these are designed these are managed these are operated by itp body i mean imagine just one small aspect of it we don't only talk about just engineering for example there is what is called humanitarian technology uh, you know um, uh, what you can also work on right okay what is that means it is a it is a it is an affinity group where technology want to make something to the human benefit okay so advancing technology for humanity that is our our motto that is our tag line why because technology all this you develop everything you make do all this research of course you will make some money in the process but it is also important you want to bring a person on the street along with you the benefits of what you achieve is something which you want to pass on to the larger community so we also work on areas like that so i mean obviously you i can keep on talking for hours together uh, this is such a big 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 field of professional body and i can also tell you in case some of you are still not ieee members i think it is today it's a time where you become ieee member you will never you know repent for this in fact you will really see why you were not a member so far and how you lost such an opportunity so far so uh, i think it is something very good but having said that uh, you know I, i also want to wish on my part that uh, you know any of you who took up engineering for a certain liking that you have maybe you took uh, electronics for a certain liking you took computer for some certain liking i think it's very important having chosen a path it is very important that we should aim for excellence in what you have you know there's no point in you know just doing engineering because you got in uh, doing a job just because you got the job uh, you know that is something all of us do but i think you want to be something unique i think the only way that you can become unique is by by developing expertise on the field that you love this is very important okay you will be remembered for what great things you have done not so much from where you come from which country you come from uh, who are your parents or you know whatever i mean okay to certain level it will help but your identity is what your hard work and what you brought to that pedestal i think and you will enjoy it so it's very important that take it to a level where uh, you will give your best of your ability and uh, you know rest is history i have no doubt that you will do wonders uh, if you can really follow this path
Thank you once again. Good afternoon, everybody. So, thanks On once again to uh, the DPC and uh, Vasha ma'am and also to uh, Professor Yeshidas and all other student branch uh, committee uh, for giving me this opportunity to interact with you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. In fact, uh, we would like to thank uh, IEEE Bombay section for giving us such opportunity to have this webinar series. So thank you for that. Also. Uh, sure, sure, sure. So sure. I would now okay. request our uh, IEEE student branch joint secretary to kindly give a vote of thanks. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the organizing team, I would like to thank our speaker for today, Dr. Satya Narayana, for carrying out this webinar in the most excellent manner. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation. Furthermore, I would like to inform all the audience to fill in the feedback form in the comment section below within an hour to issue your e-certificates. The link for the next webinar will be provided to you by tonight. Thank you and have a nice day.